Okay. All right. This week we'll start up with. Uh, well, let's see. We we uh, uh, just briefly recap the uh, progress on the task group and what needs to be done next. Um, uh, let's talk about records and tuples, and then I, uh, Brian, and I will reprise our presentation that we may do uh, about the progress on this. Sound good? Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Um, the uh, it, just to recap, what was, off, what was said off the call regarding the task group. Michael Ficarra would like to uh, figure out the scoping, organization, and scheduled calls before organizing a task group, and Daniel. You mentioned something. I'll let you let you speak for yourself uh, about uh, organization and the exact comms. Oh, just uh, I think now would now would be the time to get this chartering done. Ideally, we could have something on the agenda for this upcoming TC39 meeting, and then the results of that could go to uh, to add an agenda item for the exec com meeting that's on October first because ideally the chartering of these TGs should be reviewed by the exit com and then it would be referred to the GA. But in practice, you could start whenever it's just nice to get the ball rolling. Would uh, someone from this group like to get in touch with Michael and, uh, uh, and see if we can get that ball rolling? Uh, it, it sounds like he needs help. I've been poking him several times, um, but I, I don't think beyond the emails and uh, stuff on GitHub, we have a more direct means to get a hold of him. Sure. Well, maybe, maybe the next step could be uh, just sort of write a potential charter and email it to various people and say, does anybody have any concerns? Otherwise, I'll put this on the agenda. Yeah, in the chat here, I've I made a slide deck for a proposed scoping. Um, I don't have any preferences on organizational structure, and it seems Michael has uh, a desire for a more rigid organizational structure than I would produce. So if somebody wants to take over that part um, and propose something, that would be good. All right. Um, let's uh, let's keep that on the back of their minds. If by the end of the meeting we have somebody who's interested in volunteering to produce a charter, um, we'll we'll make a note of it. Um, okay. Let's move on to uh, records and tuples update. Uh, Daniel, you wanted to uh, restate and clarify your understanding of the changes that we've previously discussed. Yeah. Oh, I want to come in about the slide deck. It's great that you wrote that. But I think, uh, I hope the, the, the group, the security TG can feel comfortable for people to sign on for without feeling like they're signing on to like the validity of the frame. Because that will probably be a big topic of the discussion in the, in the group. Yes, uh, and anyway. on the GitHub thread, I've stated that we should figure out the exact scoping before we do meetings so they would be actually signing into some sort of agreement on scoping process itself and how we manage it is not actually specified in that slide deck okay i'll have to think more about this um anyway for records and temples the big thing is based on past discussions that we've had in this group, uh, Nicolo has prepared a spec specification change to add box to the record and tuple proposal. So the, the idea is for, to add it first to then, the... Then, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to, to put a clarification from last time first um, about uh, a suggestion that was made uh, notably by Mark about uh, making the prop, uh, the records and tuple structures shallow. Um, do, do you mind if we do that quickly now? Uh, sure. Yeah, uh, so I, after discussing last time, I am under the understanding that it has been proposed that we could change the proposal to make it shallow and make 
box that we're going to talk about just after uh, not useful and or at least um, not needed, right? Um, which um, so at the moment the, the the champion group wants to reiterate the fact that we really want the uh, proposal to be uh, deeply mutable um, um, in n not theoretically because we know that if you have a box inside of a recorded tuple uh, structure, uh, it's effectively not an Im uh, a fully deeply mutable data structures. But uh, at the same time, we want that to be reflected as part of the developer experience. And the advantage is that if you can reflect about the fact whether you have uh, a box inside of a recorded tuple data stru uh, structure, you um, if you know that there is no box in there, you know that the record and tuple uh, structure is JSON run tripable um, as well. So that is a nice property, and that is a property that we would like to to keep if that's possible. Uh, that's just what I wanted to say about last time's discussion. Uh, if you have any questions or anything. So does that does that still uh, have the notion that there there would be a predicate so that you could? Uh, uh, ask if a particular node really is deeply immutable? Yes, so there would yes. be a predicate that would let you know if there is a box in there. And if there is a box in there, you would know that it's not deeply immutable because the box just opens up the, immutabil uh, the immutability at a certain place. Okay, so, um, okay, so uh, is there, the, the ra since we've gone back and forth on this, is there someplace where the rationale in favor of the box um, being a you know being present not just syntactically but in the API and semantically is there some place where the rationale for that is written down? This is exactly where we're coming to, so I will let it to Dan now. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah, you kind of already gave away the, the story. So, I mean, I think writing up the rationale formally is a to do item for us. Um, I mean, Nicolo, if you want to present the, the patch that you wrote, you can do that. Or, okay. E either way, um, the, the idea would be that, you know, we're still, we're still thinking about whether or not records and tuples should be in objects or primitives, but the conclusion that we came to in this group seemed to be that shallowly immutable in practice, I mean, in, in theory, but in practice with this extra uh, sort of ergonomic thing of requiring that you make an explicit box. Um, it seemed like that would be compatible with membranes, that that was our analysis. And it seems like there's sufficient use cases. So we are thinking of including this in the record and tuple MVP. And that's, Something that we were thinking of presenting at the next TC39 meeting based on uh, Nicolo spec work. Uh, do people here have any concerns with that or are there any details to, to go into? Um, so my concern is not driven by membranes. Um, uh, the idea that there would be a membrane issue either way hadn't actually occurred to me. Um, it probably should be examined. I mean, it also hasn't been examined. You know, I also haven't thought about it much. But um, uh, from our previous conversation, um, I could see the rationale for, uh, you know, something syntactically distinct um, uh, for the literal form, uh, but uh, I thought we were kind of uh, talking ourselves out of there being a API or semantic distinction. Uh, so the syntactic distinction, uh, I don't really see how that makes sense. Um, I think we, okay, but what is the, what uh, I was is talk, the, what we is were the, talking about something like you would mark it only when including it, but that Nicolo found that there's some, some basic common cases where it's just not, it's just not composable to do that because if you like spread an object into itself, you kind of want or a record into, into another record, you kind of want that to always work. And if you had to note the mutability or note the, the presence of box, whenever you do that, it would 
it would sort of not be composable in the way that you would expect. Okay, so, 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 the, I think so, the, so the problematic, the, 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 the most immediately problematic case that we identified last time uh, is uh, the ones that arise uh, at the, um, uh, if we generalize the read-only collections proposal so that it plays nicely with the records and tuples proposal, and in particular, uh, introduce a, um, a, uh, a, a, a array that's, that's in the typed array family but can hold arbitrary values, but in which the array itself is, is, a, you know, is, is a normal mutable array uh, in the typed array family that differs only that it can hold uh, arbitrary values. And then to have the same snapshot diverge uh, read-only view available on um, arrays and on, uh, as we would on maps and sets. Uh, and then the idea, the hope, which I still think would be good if we could get there, is that the snapshot of a, I don't know what you call it, the disciplined array. The snapshot of a disciplined array would be a tuple and the diverge of a tuple would be a disciplined array. Oh, right. That was the reason why we couldn't have a DREF call when accessing it, because then the snapshot would, would be different. I had forgotten about that when we were reviewing yeah. Uh, yeah, that, iterations yeah, of this. We, yeah, that we was finished sort of that. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say we finished that conversation by saying that the prop, the requirement for a box is more of a function of the record and tuple itself and not of like some identitless object or like structural primitive, like the, the syntactic requirement for record and tuple could also just be a requirement to use the box primitive or box object or whatever. And then record read only collections just don't have to do that. That, I think that was the ultimate conclusion we came to. No, but but the, if the if a disciplined array hold, can, holds an arbitrary object, and the snapshot of a disciplined array um, uh, uh, is a, is a tuple that holds the same object, the snapshot would have to wrap the object in a box in order to be a proper tuple according to the semantics that I think you guys are proposing, uh, and then the diverge. Uh, putting it back into a disciplined array would automatically unwrap all the boxes. Um, it's, 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 I, I don't, I don't yeah, understand it, how these things would play together. Well, oh, I have to agree with Mark that it would be nice if the snapshot of an array was a tuple. That's like the natural thing. We don't want to make a whole lot of things that are kind of copying each other in different ways. Uh, unless we had a story about how, well, Tuples are this structure that we're especially concerned about the, you know, default deep immutability, the ergonomics of that, and the error checking that you get from that. That would be sort of the story that we would have to construct in order to justify that we have a separate structure, which is the array snapshot that's also identity list, but yeah, doesn't have boxes. I, yeah, I, I really don't want the language to have both tuples and identity list uh, arrays. Uh, because that is identity list arrays and tuples are, are, are concepts that are so close to each other. And I think this is the only thing that stands in the way of um, you know, bringing these two ideas together. I, well, presumably. I, the, 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 I think the conflict then here is the desire for um, this kind of like immutability integrity across all instances of all tuples and not necessarily maybe tuples constructed by the user manually using the literal syntax or like tuple that map or something. So we have to so what, that. So, so what is the, can somebody state the integrity property? Um, I, the integrity property would be, how do I describe this? That the, I'm losing my train of thought. That the that pro, a, a chain of property accesses from a tuple will only ever access like if it's just plain property accesses will only ever access immutable data. No, it'll also access a box, and the so, box is mutable. Well, so it's, then the, it's the integrity it's no property is that at the frontier between the deeply immutable data and the normal mm -hmm. and the and the object mutable data, there's an explicit operation that you use to cross from one world to the other. 
And the rationale for that is because you, you conceptualize those two worlds differently. You treat them, you treat them differently. And uh, so this would hopefully avoid, avoid bugs that happen by you think you're in one world, but you actually are in the other world. Okay, uh, that, that's, that's, that's well stated. I, I understand that. Um, uh, I don't have, uh, it's, it's the kind of rationale I respect. Um, uh, and whether, um, uh, how this one would play out, I don't yet have an intuition for. Uh, as we went over last time, uh, my experience with similar concepts in similar languages was enough different that, that we should be suspicious that it generalizes. Um, but, but that is why I'm uh, very skeptical that the, that the introduction of the box on the frontier without a, um, you know, without a rights amplification step um, uh, is actually doing anything for you. Uh, with the, when I say without, the rights without what step? Okay, so in the version of all this where we had um, uh, symbols as weak map keys, uh, the, 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 the box equivalent, and, and you know, we can just say box rather than, than symbol, but the idea would be that the, if the box itself was not adequate to get to the mutable value, if it was the box plus something that gave you that you know that, that gave you the, the the corresponding mutable values that were registered with it, and if you didn't have that amplifier, uh, you couldn't see past the boxes. Uh, that's I mean, that that was that, that right. That's that how that symbols as weak map keys worked because you needed right. the the weak map to be able to mm -hmm. reference them. But I think that one I see what it accomplishes because you're actually denying access by denying the amplifier. Uh, right, but I think this property is just, is not a capabilities argument. It's, it's more about developer, developer awareness of these, yeah. you know, no, which context they're in. I got that. I got that, and 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 um, that's that's. I, I got that when I said that it's the kind of rationale that I respect, and it might be right. Um, uh, uh, I'd really like some sense of what the nature of the bug would be if you do a, de a deep navigation that's, cro that's, that's, that's crossing the mutability boundary when you didn't expect it. Whereas uh, forcing you to do a deref um, would be, you know, th th that would be saving you from those bugs. I just, I just don't have a good intuition for whether there's actually a, a plausible bug scenario that this is addressing in practice. Okay, so I think that's a good action item for us to document such a use case and uh, so we can make the discussion more concrete because we don't currently have something written up about that. Okay. So just for the array snapshot case, do you think that it would not be acceptable to throw an error if the array contains like mutable objects and so users would have to do something like array dot map box no, it, it, that completely that, that completely destroys the usability of snapshot um, uh, and the way, the way in which you know one would generalize it to maps and sets um, the, uh, the, the, you know, the the idea is that um, uh, you know, you're talking about a, a category of collection that can contain arbitrary values and that you're, um, uh, and that the, the snapshotted form is shallowly immutable, but, um, but contains the same, um, you know, contains the, the a snapshot of what the, um, what the collection was that you did the snapshot operation on. Okay, right? So, a, a, you know, contains the same contents 
that the original collection had at the moment of snapshot. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I understand it. Yeah, I think this is just going to require some more thinking. I didn't consider, I didn't fully understand this problem space until just now. Um, okay. I think, I think we're going to have to think about it. Yeah, I think some, I think this covers the topic enough for us to go back and think about it more. I mean, there was a lot more on the agenda, right? Okay. Or, what were you going to say, Mark? Uh, I it, it certainly you know ups the priority for me to get back to the read-only collections proposal and to actually uh, you know expand it to include a disciplined array um, of some form, so that we can try to take the 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 um, non. Um, and work towards reconciling them with tuples. Uh, the other thing, the other thing about the about the uh, you know the where I want to go with read-only collections and reconciling it is that I would like the snapshotted map and the snapshotted set to themselves be um, similarly immutable, so that uh, if um, a tuple contains them and they and they only contain, um, you know, records and tuples, and you know, snapshotted rec um, maps and sets. That that you can still have a deeply immutable structure that includes the uh, immutable maps and sets. Um, uh, Would that then mean that if you snapshot a map, or, you know, like a map that contains an object? A non like a regular object that you're you're like implicitly deciding whether or not the snapshotted thing has an identity or not. The no the, the, snapshot the, objects is, is objects. You're, the snapshot is not a deep operation; it's a shallow one. Right. Exactly. That, well, exactly. yes, but I'm I'm saying that if you snapshot a map that contains an object, the map the returned snapshotted map will quote unquote have identity based on whether or not it contains no. an identity. No, the 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 the, it the would snapshot the box. Map, if you take two two separate snapshotted maps, even with different enumeration orders, that contain exactly the same key value mapping, where in the case of of keys or ob or values with identity, the same includes the identity. But but oh, two see, maps okay. of different orders that have the same contents would be same key. Would compare same yeah. key. I see. Just like so, just I, like I wanted to mention. It's Wanted to mention about the same key idea. I've already gotten some amount of pushback from implementers about the negative zero versus zero identifying those with each other. And I imagine that same key, for example, if we allow symbols and records unsorted or this, this map concept in more generality uh, could encounter more pushback from the, from the angle of, will it be optimizable to, uh, to do, I think I think um, that's an important I think that's an important investigation. Obviously, if there is a, a, a real problem there, um, that's that's a serious issue. Um, but uh, simply anticipating possible problems and encountering unease uh, is is you know is not a reason to stop. Um, uh, oh, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was this this huge um, uh, design issue. Uh, back when we first introduced maps and sets uh, about uh, iteration order. Um, and everybody um, who, had ex who had implemented, you know, using, using hash tables was just used to the idea that uh, identity hash tables enumerate their elements in, a, a, in an arbitrary order uh, according to the happenstance of the identity hashing. Um, and um, uh, it, it, uh, that one didn't get settled until, I forget who it was at Mozilla, uh, uh, implemented Tyler Close's um, implementation scheme, uh, but did it in a way that was comparable with the tuned maps and sets that Mozilla already had working internally. Um, 
and found that, that even without a similar level of tuning, that the ones using uh, Tyler's technique uh, took, I think it was one third more space, but actually performed faster, which surprised everybody, including Tyler. Tyler's analysis was that they should be, would perform the same. Uh, we think they're performing actually better because of cash effects. But as far as I know, nobody really knows why they're performing better. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it, that, that one, you know, we, it, until that experiment happened, we had months of really strong developer objections um, meeting the really strong need for, uh, to not introduce new sources of non-determinism. Yeah, I mean, I've heard different versions of the story from other implementers. I don't want to get into it, but uh, I, I actually want to not just find one, uh, not just find one implementation where, you know, there's some space overhead and, you know, people say maybe it's okay and say that that's enough. I actually want to talk to all the implementers and make sure that everybody's good with it before we go ahead. Well, uh, after the, after you know, that because this proposal's... Because this yeah. proposal is really big, uh, I kind of want to hold us to a high standard of having consulted everybody and making sure that everybody's okay with it. So there's kind of resentment there so that it actually gets shipped once it gets to stage yeah. three and four. Okay, but, but, but I think the lesson from, from the previous story still applies, which is uh, sometimes it takes one experiment that, that succeeds in order to convince the other implementers to give it a serious try. And, and clearly, if the other implementers had run into a roadblock, uh, that would have stopped that proposal as well. Well, implementers in, in EA6, implementers saying that something was going to be slow didn't stop things. Like, I did object to various things because they would be slow, and they said, no, you can't do that. So, uh, and then they were slow, and now people are talking later about reverting them. Uh, which, which things so, do you have in mind? You know, I don't, I, it's, I think it's, well, I mean, one is classical billions, the things like regex subclassing, and uh, uh, um, and yeah. another was um, er, array return. I mean, iterator return, and yeah, and the committee just didn't accept the performance okay. arguments or the arguments about lack of use case. So okay. I'm really trying to make sure that the committee is a place where those arguments are respected, even if I'm not the one making them, and even if it's my proposal, they would be going against. Okay. Yeah, the, the iterators returning a fresh object each time, that one really surprised me. Um, and I, re I remember discussing it in committee and being surprised, my memory of it is that the implementers in the room at the time, I don't remember who they were, but it was, it was certainly multiple browsers, just felt like this was something that they could optimize away um, because the objection was raised. And if the implementers hadn't been um, relaxed about it. I, I think it would have stopped that. I remember. There are many different things about the iteration call that have unfortunate overhead. And there's been a lot of effort put into optimizing them, but I feel like the iteration protocol is something that's, that's so useful that it ends up deserving this optimization. What would be extremely unfortunate is if there's like an unlikely edge case that requires a lot of optimization work for it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the case with like regex subclassing. And it might be the case with, um, you know, symbols in records requiring this order independent comparison. If that ends up being a big source of complexity, that's kind of my fear. If, if there aren't, you know, use cases to justify it, yeah, so, I, so the, um, uh, if we do an order independent comparison, um, uh, what, I th what, what, um, what I would like to advocate is something that we did not, uh, um, I, I did not advocate last time we talked, um, uh, is that the order of records uh, be treated the way we treat the orders of properties in an object. Um, uh, so that they can be arbitrarily different, but you still have uh, for records, the order independent comparison. So it's not just that, that, that the symbols are being compared order independently, it's that all the properties are being compared order independently. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought you were proposing and that's kind of what I'm responding to because the, you know, I feel like we, 
we kind of thought that if it's just string keys, then it's probably doesn't cause a serious problem to sort the keys. And introducing basically requiring a sort each time you compare two records, unless it gets interned. But every time you intern it, you also have to, you know, provide a sorted exemplar to compare against the other ones. Uh, that's, you know, that's an extra thing. That's an extra, you know, of the one of a thousand cuts to add to the, to the usages, to the implementation complexity. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that if we do something like that, that it's justified by, by user value. Yep. Yep. I, I agree. It, 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 it needs to be justified by the user value. So maybe we could all think about, you know, what, what developer benefit would there be from having same key treat record keys this way and extending that to immutable maps as keys of mm -hmm. records or maps or, or, I mean, not records, but immutable maps that are keys of maps so that those are compared this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything more to say on this topic? Uh, I, 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 I think that um, I think that I heard a concern about the optimizability of um, of comparing equivalent objects with equivalent properties, but in different orders. Is that correct? Yeah, that was that was my concern. Uh, Not that it would be impossible, but that it would be kind of harder. Um, my, I, I think I feel like it's a good time to uh, to say again um, that I think that there is an obvious uh, high performance way to do that that is not complicated. Um, that being that I usually um, identity full objects are compared are, are hashed based off of the underlying memory address and that's just not revealed to the user because of uh, insertion order iteration um, for um, identityless objects I would propose that the uh, that the hash key for such an object be an aggregate of the hash keys of its uh, of the objects or values it's comprised of um, like obviously a number would correspond its hash key would be the number itself strings would be uh, effectively a hash of the string um, the, uh, for a composite object, I would suggest that the, uh, that the aggregate hash key of such an object, like a record would be the, uh, the Zor sum of the, um, the composite keys and values, um, because that has the nice, and, and this would apply for records as and tuples and for maps and sets. Um, for immutable maps and sets, that is, uh, in the same way, because uh, it has this nice property that if you were to create, uh, um, it, 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 that it's fast to insert and remove and recompute that that hash index um, on bo uh, both for values entering and exiting the collection, um, and it's symmetric regardless of order. So I. Uh... I agree that that's the, you know, if we want to optimize this, then that's uh, part of it. So basically for records and tuples, we need a two level intern table. We need one, uh, we need a, a hash code, which is independent, which is like a same key hash code. So just for negative zero, we need a hash algorithm that will hash zero and negative zero to the same thing and the the algorithm that you're explaining for, for keys makes sense, though probably we would also want the values to be part of the hash code somehow. Yes, they would. Uh, yeah. So, uh, the, so then within a hash bucket, we're still going to have to do comparisons between, uh, you know, the 
one one way to do it is kind of a linear scan. Uh, eventually, if you want to optimize it further, if you want to optimize, you know, triple equals, you probably want to store also like a pointer to an exemplar in the hash set, in the hash bucket that everything is, you know, same key to. Uh, but when you're when you're finding that exemplar, you're doing repeated comparisons over everything in the in the hash bucket. So you're you're able to cache this, uh, but those comparisons will be slower because you'll have to start by sorting the you'll have to start by sorting the keys and doing these different kind of yeah. transformations so we'll, and we'll have and we'll have more hash collisions the more things that we make same key the bigger our hash bucket will be because we'll just have more yes. things that yeah so then that means more comparisons so i think there's an algorithm for this, but it has to cost. I see. I see. The, so, so if I restate your uh, your point, is that while it is trivial to solve the problem of uh, of cr a, a composite hash key, it is not trivial to come up with a, tri uh, a fast equivalence operation in the cases where there are hash collisions. Is that uh, fair? Yeah, I don't have an idea for how. To, I mean, I think we could we could cache the results by having each thing have a pointer to its exemplar in the in the hash set. But when you allocate a new object and compare it for the first time, then you'll then you have to do a linear scan over things in its in its hash bucket. Yes. It, or it, I, can, I can't think of an algorithm better than that. Maybe other people here can think of a better algorithm. Well, you can. Uh, basically, I think what you're saying is that it is possible to make the common case fast, but there will always be a degenerate case, which is slow, which is uh, par for the course with hash maps in general. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'm overthinking it. <laughs> well, I think, I think this is, I mean, th this again, reminds me of the kinds of conversations uh, that we had about de uh, deterministic uh, versus arbitrary enumeration order of maps and sets which is first we argued about uh, complexity measure and sort of the normal kind of uh, paper uh, algorithm analysis. And only when um, uh, it, you know, it, it held up to all of the arguments there, um, it still wasn't moving forward until a actual experiment was tried to where you could see what it did in an actual implementation. And I expect that um, you know, uh, this, this discussion is sort of a start on the algorithmic comparison and if the and if the 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 best algorithm for doing the the uh, hash consul um, uh, uh, for the uh, for just same value zero um, uh, uh, is is a algorithmic complexity that we can't get get to or get a hair's breadth away from uh, if if there's a significant distance between those two uh, then uh, you know that would certainly uh, be a big impediment to this idea going forward. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing to look into. Um, so I guess since we only have five minutes left, I wanted to ask for, for the next TC39 meeting when we're talking about records and tuples, would everybody feel comfortable if the framing were, you know, we've talked about this in detail with the with the SES group, who we previously thought would be the ones very concerned about having references to objects, now that we've analyzed it more, we kind of think that there that there can be, but we're not sure how the surface should look. Whether it should be some kind of explicit box or syntax, or just be implicit that references to objects are are exposed, but that this is sort of a high level direction that now we we feel open to. Is that does that match the yeah, feeling that, everybody that's, here? that's certainly fine with me. Uh, the rep, um, I would I would emphasize since you're since you're um, uh, I would emphasize that the choice that we're going back and forth over uh, is not a security concern with regard to SES security concerns. Whether box is there or not, um, uh, uh, I don't think really affects any SES relevant security concern. So it's 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 more just on the, all the other software engineering concerns. Good. That's that's really good to 
to have a shared understanding of. Okay, well, I'm going to turn off the recording.